if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. And today uh, the plan is to conclude this chapter. Uh, We are uh, amazingly going to cover six whole verses. I know that will be shocking. And so uh, the last few recorded verses of this message go back in a way to the pattern of the earlier part of the message where Paul again is giving his own ministry as an example to these elders. Now I want to remind you that this, what we have recorded here in Acts chapter 20 is really just a summary. Uh, You can read through the whole thing in a couple of minutes and I'm sure that Paul, given an opportunity to speak, would not have spoken only for two minutes and then sat down. Uh, I think that he probably talked for quite a while. So this is just a summary of his message. The last bit of the message contains much practical wisdom, just the sort of thing you think Paul would say. Yet there is something more in this, and it is something that is felt more than expressed in, in precise verbal language. As we read this, I'm sure, I hope, that you will be able to pick up on the, um, on the emotional depth of this message that Paul is giving to these people, and then, of course, their response at the end. And I want us to be able to observe this relationship that Paul had with these men. And I've given our message this title, Maintaining Relationships in Ministry. And I want to use this experience as a way of uh, uh, describing, in a way, I hope we can get to this, what a church is ought to be, what we're trying to build in a church. And we've often talked about the image, uh, my favorite image of the church in the New Testament is the idea of a body. We're all part of one another. And it's such a vital thing. When you lose someone, you know, someone passes, as Norman did this week, we, you know, we have a, there's a vacant spot. It's not just in that spot where he always sat, but just in our hearts. We uh, we miss him, and we look forward to a reunion with him someday. Um, our own ministry here is now about 36 and a half years old. I was trying to figure this all out when we first came. We, we arrived in Victoria in 1985 on my birthday, uh, and we, uh, we started the church here about a year later. In August of 1986 was our first service. And here we are today. Now, I've known many people through this ministry, both locally and then in a wider circle, including pastors and churches all over BC, Washington, Oregon, and a few even in Alberta and Saskatchewan that I've had contact with through the years of this ministry. And, uh, and as you serve the Lord in these kinds, this kind of work, you develop relationships with people Uh, uh, Christian people all over the place, but especially in the local ministry, right here in our church. Uh, These are the deepest relationships in my life, I would have to say. Uh, There have been broken relationships as well, that's true. I would like to say it's all their fault, but I know me pretty well, so I'm sure that's not true. Christian ministry is built on relationships. And I think the things that Paul says here shows the importance and strength of the relationships he had in Ephesus. And I think they give us some keys to its longevity and and, uh, fruitfulness. Um, as As a church, we need to commit ourselves to the things that make for a persevering ministry. And that's what we're going to look at in our message today. All right, so what I want to do is I'm going to read beginning in verse 33, and we're going to go to the end of the chapter. So Acts 20, verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. 
You yourselves know that these things ministered to my own needs and to the men who are with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again, and they were accompanying him to the ship. So uh, that's the passage. Here's our proposition. Persevering ministry depends on the dedicated lives of, of disciples. Persevering ministry depends on the dedicated lives of disciples. So that is going to be the focus of our message. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the depth of the relationships. And you'll notice that I'm going to the last few verses first. I'm going to look at our text uh, in a backwards order. So first of all, the depth of the relationships. Now as we read through this, the things that are happening. And Paul closes his message. And everything that happens uh, in these three verses, 36 through 38, are expressed in very brief terms. But the terms are such that make the experience exceedingly vivid and real. So we have in verse 36, the closing prayer. And I think as Paul closed his message, and stop speaking. No doubt he himself experienced a great deal of emotion. And then he began to pray. Our verse says he knelt down and prayed with them all. I'm sorry, I get all emotional myself when I think of these kinds of things. This is a leave taking with people with whom he has a deep personal relationship. I'm sure he caught one of them, put his arm around him. So he began to pray. Another one on the other side. Perhaps they all joined in a circle. Praying for the work in Asia Minor, in Ephesus, and the cities around that they had been planting churches in. And uh, just calling on the Lord. That's verse 36. Verse 37, they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him. And you can just see the scene. They know that he has to go. There's things that have to be done. They are, he's deeply beloved. They are deeply beloved. And there's a lot of embracing Goodbyes being said, last words, encouragements. It's a deep, very deep personal moment. And then it says, they wept mostly because he said he wouldn't see them again. And then it says, they accompanied him to the ship. And you can just see them. They're walking down. We already have this meeting. I don't know. They walk down the streets. They're heading to the pier. They see him walk up the gangplank, if they had a gangplank. He boards the ship and turns to wave. And soon he's going to be off. It's a very, very powerful moment the emotions of this scene testify to the depths of the relationships. These men are men who are converted in Paul's Ephesian ministry. Now, I didn't put this one on the screen. I meant to. I don't know why I didn't. But if you'll just look back into chapter 19 and look at verse 8 and 10. This describes in 8 through 10. It, it describes in a summary form the ministry as it began in Ephesus, it re really as it began. The first little bit is about those disciples of John that Paul uh, encountered, and they were converted. And perhaps some of these men, some of those men were in this group, perhaps. But verse 8, And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them 
about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And so here we have a very, it's a summary statement. So we're talking about Asia. That's that western, uh, southwestern corner of Turkey is a province called Asia in the Roman Empire. And Ephesus is one of the main cities. And Paul's preaching there is such that the word of God spreads not just through Ephesus, which was a notable town, but it spreads through all the towns and villages in Asia, by and large. Now, did every single person hear the gospel? Well, maybe, maybe not, but the word of God spread through that whole region. There were Christians who had come to Christ during that time. Some of these men, no doubt, were among the men who restrained Paul during the riot in Ephesus. In, uh, later in Acts 19, it's recorded in verse 30, in 31, they had this big to-do and a mob uh, uh, gathered and they grabbed some of Paul's companions and took them with them as they went down to the amphitheater. And in verse 30, it says, Paul wanted to go into the assembly. He, he wanted to address them. You know, uh, here's a crowd, I'll preach to them. I'll, <laughs> no problem. Uh, the, it says the disciples would not let him. And some of the Asiarchs, which were rulers of the city, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. It was dangerous. And so <clears throat> uh, these are these, some of the, the men who are involved in that scene are here on this uh, last meeting with Paul in Miletus. But it was through these men that other churches in the region were established. Now I'm just going to give you one example here. Uh, we have several books in uh, the New Testament where Paul has written to churches. One of them, Colossians, is written to a church where he had never visited up to this point. And uh, in fact, uh, it appears he didn't visit it until after his first imprisonment in Rome. And so we have um, uh, Colossae, Colossae is about 196 kilometers away from Ephesus. It's not a short distance, but it's not. It's within a travel, you know, traveling distance. You could probably make that. That's 196. That's 120 miles, I guess. Is that right? About 196 kilometers. So, you know, we did 20 miles a day. You could probably make it in a week by walking, uh, and so that's certainly possible. Uh, but in Colossians 1, verse 3, Paul says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. So Paul had heard about this church. and the, um, he, But as we say, he had never been there. One of the reasons we think he'd never been there is because Philemon lived in Colossae. He was a Christian there. He was a Christian known to Paul. And he says to uh, Philemon, at the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. In other words, he's hoping to come to Colossae after he's released from prison. He's writing Colossians and Philemon from the prison in Rome, where he was imprisoned the first time, and then we believe he was imprisoned a second time. And so how did this church in Colossae get started? Well, it got started through the ministry of a man named Epaphras. In Colossians 1, 7 and 8, it says, Just as you learned it, learned the gospel from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. In other words, as Paul says, I've never been to this church, but Epaphras went out from me, and he has told you about the gospel. Epaphras is also mentioned to them, commended to them, as sending greetings to this church. In Colossians 4, he says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave, 
of Jesus Christ sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. And he's mentioned also in Philemon, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. So it seems that Epaphras must have met Paul while he was in his Ephesus ministry. Perhaps he's one of these men on this beach. Perhaps he is a convert ordained to the ministry by Paul, and then he He's a native of Colossae, so he returned to Colossae. And he began to preach the gospel there and gathered a church together. And as Paul is in prison in Rome, he, uh, he goes to meet him. And maybe it says, fellow prisoner. I don't know if he was put in prison himself. But in any case, he is actually in contact with Paul as he's writing this, these two epistles. It's likely that Epaphras not only started the church in, uh, in uh, Colossae, but in the nearby Laodicea, which is fam famous because of its mention in the book of Revelation. And also there's another one that's mentioned, I think it's in Colossians, mentioned Hierapolis, another city right near Colossae, within a few miles of each other. I think Laodicea is 15 miles from Colossae and uh, Hierapolis is maybe five or ten miles from Colossae. But in any case, this activity, this man, is very likely one of the men who's standing with Paul on the beach on his leave-taking. The point of these, these that I'm making here is that Paul established deep relationships with these men, with men like Colossae, and they multiplied his work. Paul himself mainly ministered in Ephesus during his third missionary journey. The Bible doesn't tell us that he went elsewhere, he went, that he went out from there and went into other places. He could have, but it doesn't tell us that. And uh, it also tells us that, uh, uh, or the Bible also tells us about other churches in that region. And uh, in, in the book of Revelation, as I mentioned, there's seven churches that are mentioned in the first two Chapters. If you plot, plot all of those cities on a map of Asia, that's where all of those churches are from, in the province of Asia in southwestern modern-day Turkey. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, okay, that's four of them, Philadelphia, there's one I'm missing, did I say Sardis? Sardis and Laodicea. I think I got them all. Well, someone started those churches. Paul started the church in Ephesus. We think Epaphras likely started the church in Laodicea. These men went about preaching the word. When it says that Paul, the word of the gospel was heard throughout Asia, it wasn't just Paul going out preaching. It was these men. So when he called these elders together, no doubt some of them, were among those men who had planted those churches widely spreading the gospel. They spread this gospel, they did this work, and they were, they were moved by the depth of this relationship they had with the Apostle Paul. That's the first thing I want you to see. All right, so the keys to the relationships. The keys to the relationships I think we see in just a summary Look at verses 33 to 35. So first of all, in verse 33, personal integrity. Paul starts this section of the message by saying, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. This speaks to his personal integrity. Personal integrity. Paul's testimony may seem boastful. I don't think it was. But it was nevertheless a fact. Paul took extra measures to maintain his integrity. As on this very journey, he has a group of men traveling with him. Why are they traveling with him? They are traveling as an accountability factor for the offering that he has collected to take to Jerusalem. Recall, we talked about that several times in the passages going back through Acts 19 and into Acts 20. And this is for integrity purposes. Ministry relationships and 
ministries dis- disintegrate quickly when integrity is betrayed. Uh, I've heard through the years about men who have been shown to lack integrity in the ministry. When that happens in a church, it shatters the church. I mean, the church may hold together, but there's a, there, that is a deep, deep wound. And it takes years to overcome. I, was, I've know, I know a pastor who has taken a church in an area where there was something, I can't remember the, the story, there was something that went on with the previous pastor, some kind of scandal. It takes years, not only for that church to recover, but for internally, but for its gospel witness in the community to recover. It's very shattering. Personal integrity is absolutely key to the ongoing effectiveness of a ministry. Trust is hard won, is easily destroyed. You can forgive, that's true, but it takes much time to trust again, if ever. So the relationship Paul had with these men depended strongly on integrity. So personal integrity, that's the first thing. The second thing I notice in verse 34 and 35, he says, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were working, who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. All right, and so this is talking about his role as a tent maker. We use that term. We know that it, that was his trade. And so I call this personal integrity, but then public ministry. His public ministry. At 1 Corinthians 9, 6, it appears that Barnabas as well followed this same policy. They both were workers. So bivocational ministers are not a new thing to the church. The word bivocational is new. Okay. Paul was just preaching, and well, he was working too to supply his needs. His outside Work supported not only himself, but others. Apparently, it was useful to support members of his own team in verse 34. And he also mentions as an example that he does these things to show that they should support the weak, those who are unable to support themselves for one reason or another. And so his outside work supported himself and others. Paul intended this as a public example for the Ephesian elders, an example of self-sacrifice, an example of hard work. Uh, I, I put in my notes here to underscore the ministry of hard work. As you look in verse 35, in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. You see, he wants to underscore them, to emphasize for them the burden of, of living for others. Nothing builds a church like giving of one's labor to one another and the work of God. I mean, we we work together to promote God's work here, even in such things as doing physical repairs around the building. The relationships among our men, especially, who are usually the ones doing that, are built through that labor. When our ladies labor in the kitchen, it's mostly the ladies laboring in the kitchen, I know that. Sometimes the men, we can descend to that level, or ascend, maybe I should say ascend to that level. Careful how you say these things. I said it that way on purpose, of course, to get a rise out of you. But anyway, the thing is, relationships are built This is how we grow together as a body of Christ, working hard together in the work of the ministry. And it's not just these physical things, but as we labor to try to give the gospel to others, to pray. When somebody comes with a burden, I talked to so-and-so this week, coming Wednesday night, talked to so-and-so this week, would you pray for him? He needs to know the Lord. We're laboring together. Modern writers talk about taking ownership. That's another buzzword, just like bivocational. 
taking ownership of your church. Well, the local church, it doesn't belong to anyone, but it needs to become our church. I've heard people say, oh, you know, uh, over at your church, I'm talking about me, it's, it's my church, it's not my church. It is, of course, the Lord's church, but even within, in a sanctified sense, I believe it's our church. We're serving our Lord together in this place. We have bonds. We do this by working together for one another. That's what we do. So, personal integrity, public ministry, and you're going to like the last one in my list for verse 35. I'll just read verse 35, the last part. And he says, And remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Well, let me read the whole verse. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So have personal integrity, public ministry, paradigmatic commitment. <laughs> My wife is scornful. All right. Well, it is a fancy word. I put fancy word alert. This is to sa satisfy the vain egotism of alliteration. Par what is a paradigm? A paradigm is a pattern a template to follow. So a paradigmatic commitment. This is, this, is a, this is a principle that was taught by the Lord as a pattern for us all to follow. What is the paradigm? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now what's interesting about this particular statement from the Lord is, you will search the Gospels in vain and you will never find these words. However, every commentary says Jesus surely spoke them. There were things that were not recorded in the Gospels that Jesus spoke. And this is one of them. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It was something that Paul had heard through one of the other disciples. And it was something he treasured something that he lived by, something that he passed on to others. The Lord Jesus himself taught self-sacrifice by word and by deed. And the church requires this kind of commitment for growth. And so when we're talking, we talked about the depth of the relationships, and that impelled a great deal of the work that was done in Asia. And I've talked about these three things that I've observed in this last bit of the message that are keys to the relationships. So if you have a group of men or a, a group of Christians, men and women, committed to the same work who possess personal integrity, are active in public ministry, are committed to the paradigmatic pattern given by the Lord, then you will maintain long-term and deep Christian relationships. This will make your life in the local church deep and rich. You know, there is a certain personality that uh, I think I, I have to a certain extent. I, w I was never one of the cool kids. Ne I was sort of on the outside looking in. And so you become very scornful because you can't be on the inside. You're not cool enough. So you're very c scornful of those on the inside. And I have observed that sometimes people have a scornful attitude towards the church. Oh, they're just a clique. They're just a private club. Now, we strive, we strive to be very welcoming and encourage you to be welcoming to other people and involve them in the work of the Lord. But it's very possible for somebody to sort of be on the fringe and look on the outside and, and feel like they're not a part of it. But if we will be committed to this kind of, to personal spiritual integrity and to an active public ministry and to following the pattern that the Lord Jesus laid down, well then, that makes the life in the church deep and rich. And I will tell you, if you're on the outside, jump in and get involved in the work of the Lord and you will begin to see the depth of the kind of relationships you can have with Christians, not only the Christians, but also with the Lord and the kind of life you can have serving the Lord. This will give enduring strength to the ministry. 
And now I want you to turn, <clears throat> I've got one more point, uh, to Revelation chapter 2. And I want to show you what I mean by enduring strength. And I don't have this one on the screen, so you will have to look it up if you want to follow the words. So Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to begin in the first verse. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now we're not going to touch on everything that's in this Verse, I will note that that word, as he begins, to the angel of the church, that is taken uh, to mean to the pastor of the church. He's not talking about an angel. He's talking about the pastor there. And our point here is the power of the relationships. Okay, so we started with the depth. We saw that in the leave-taking. The keys, we saw that in Paul's message. And now the power of the relationships, a persevering ministry. Oh, I guess I did put it on the screen and I forgot all about it. All right, we'll skip past that because that's all I'm going to do with that for right now. Now, these words were spoken by the Lord Jesus to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos about A.D. 95. Revelation chapter 2, the whole book of Revelation, came to John, and especially these two chapters, 2 and 3, were spoken directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. Read chapter 1, you'll see how it's the Lord Jesus who's appearing to him and who is the one who is speaking. And this is the year 95. Now Paul in Acts 20 is preaching in about A.D. 56 or 57. So we are almost exactly 40 years on. Paul is long gone now. And Timothy is probably gone. He pastored this church for a while. And now John is uh, in uh, is reputed to be the pastor of Ephesus, although he's in exile. He's an old man by this time. And he's writing back to them. Now, notice the commendation of the church. Verse 2 and 3, he says, I know your deeds and toil and perseverance. See that word? I know you cannot tolerate evil. I know you test those who claim apostleship but are not. I know you have perseverance, he says again. I know you have endured for my name's sake. That's Jesus speaking. I know you have not grown weary. So what I want to say is that they, the work of these elders, whom Paul addressed in that church, and he gave them his heartfelt advice and left his personal example, the men who were left behind to continue the ministry, they had a great and enduring ministry. Forty years later, we still have a very strong church in Ephesus. Now, yes, there is a criticism. They have left their first love. Their hearts have lost their fire. Maybe they were going through the motions. They are still orthodox in their theology. Their teaching and doctrine was strong, but they had become somewhat complacent. We don't know exactly what all that means, but there was a criticism. And there is a solution. Remember your former place. Repent. Do the deeds that you did from the first. That's in verse 5. Now, we do know that the church in Ephesus lasted for many, many, many years. We hear of it being mentioned amongst the church fathers 100, 200, 300 years later. However, let me, re me remind you, today, Ephesus, well, the city is gone, 
Such as it is, there is a settlement nearby, but the city itself is gone. But that location is in Turkey, which is dominated by Islam. The candlestick was removed eventually. Eventually it was. So our proposition again, persevering ministry depends on the dedicated lives of the disciples. May God help us to be those disciples. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul and these dedicated and anonymous Christians. Maybe one of them was Epaphras, who were meeting with Paul that day and who spoke with him and, and bade him farewell and continued the work of the ministry. Lord, I pray that you would help us now to continue that work here in this place. Lord, help us not to lose our first zeal. Help us to put our shoulders into the work. Help us to love one another. Help us to serve faithfully. Help us to make you supreme in every aspect of our lives. And may your name be glorified in Victoria, British Columbia, as we preach the word of God in this place. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.